Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paula, and uh, thank you all for coming here. It's fantastic to see such a, uh, a wonderful gathering. I'm so impressed. I, when I went into the website yesterday, I was going to put a, an ad on my Twitter account at Danville Hall, encouraging my friends and followers in Monaco to come along and uh, attend it. Then I saw this banner. It said, sold out. I couldn't believe it. I thought, that's brilliant. Well done. Uh, well done, Paula, and well done to the um, American uh, Club of the Riviera as well. I look forward to um, talking to your members later on. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, I think it's a, it's a great idea to have a collaboration between um, this um, wonderful library and the Glucksman Ireland House in New York, which is the, the premier center in the United States for Irish and Irish-American studies. And, of course, Princess Grace was the epitomized really the the success and the uh, the achievement of Irish American. In fact, I would say that the two iconic figures of Irish American in the 20th century were John F. Kennedy and Princess Grace. So it's entirely appropriate that um, there should be this transatlantic link with Glucksman Ireland House at NYU. So I would like to take you on a a spin. An odyssey. An odyssey is a kind of sounds like a pretentious word, doesn't it? But it's a it's, it's a spin, or, a, or 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 as we say in Ireland, in Irish, it's a truss or, or or a journey, and and the journey is really through Irish history and literature, and it's um it's a journey that I've taken over the last uh, forty plus years, since I uh, well it's actually closer to fifty years now since I started uh, studying literature and history at University College Cork in nineteen seventy two more than 50 years. Goodness, uh, time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? Anyway, um, so it was really then that I, um, that I sort of became enchanted with the work of W.B. Yeats and James Joyce. But before I get on to that, I just want to say that uh, the Ireland I was born into was a very different Ireland from the Ireland that exists today. And if you were to to pick a piece of writing that epitomized the Ireland of the mid-50s, the time when Princess Grace came here as princess from the United States, you would probably pick a poem like Evan Boland's poem, The Emigrant Irish. I'll just quote you a few lines from it. Like oil lamps, we put them out the back of our houses, of our minds. And then... A time came, this time and now, we need them. Their dread makeshift example. Their hardships parceled in them. Patience, fortitude, long suffering in the bruised colored dusk of the new world and all the old songs and nothing to lose. That was the experience of Princess Grace's grandfather when he left Ireland in the 1860s. But it was still the experience of many people who left Ireland around the time I was born. Because in 1955, 45,000 Irish people were emigrating every year from a country that had a population of less than 3 million. You can imagine how damaging that was to the psyche of Ireland. And I suppose the story of Ireland in the last 70 years is one of recovery from that trough of despair. And that recovery started in the mid-50s when Ireland joined the United Nations, having been kept out for 10 years by the Soviet Union. Suddenly, the world opened up to us. In the late 50s, people started thinking about joining the European Union or the European Economic Community, as it was in those days. And I think Ireland took great inspiration from the achievements of people like Princess Grace and John F. Kennedy. Because America was this shining example of how the Irish could go and in difficult circumstances could triumph over adversity. And, that's the, and there was a piece in the Irish Times about a month ago by an Irish academic writing about Irish America which claimed that Princess Grace's elevation or her 
assent to being Princess Grace of Monaco was a kind of a, a sign that Irish America had made it. And then, of course, a further crown was put on the Irish American achievement with the election in 1960 of John F. Kennedy as the President of the United States. So I, um, I went to India on my first posting in the 1980s, and I had studied literature and history at University College Cork. And in fact, my thesis, my MA thesis at that time was on, it was called The Indomitable Irishry, Writers and History in Ireland between 1890 and 1991, the death of Parnell, and 1940, the year between the deaths of W.B. Yeats and James Joyce, both of whom, by the way, died outside of Ireland. Um, W.B. Yeats um, died uh, in Menton and was buried in uh, uh, Rook, uh, Um And I, in fact, I, I climbed my way up to the cemetery there uh, this afternoon uh, and uh, I'm still feeling the effects uh, on, my <laughs> on my legs of that fairly punishing <laughs> climb. But it was worth it to get up there and see the wonderful vista from that cemetery where Yeats, which was Yeats's first resting place. I suppose I was actually drawn in by a by one of Yeats's by the speech Yeats made in Stockholm in December 1923. We're reaching the centenary this year of Yeats's Nobel Prize, and in that lecture he gave in Stockholm in December 1923, he said the following: "Wonderful speech, capturing." as only Yeats could, the contours of Irish history, as he saw them. Historians may have other ideas, but nonetheless, Yeats was a, in his own way, was a historian, as this passage will show. He said, the modern literature of Ireland, and indeed all that stir of thought which prepared for the Anglo-Irish War, began when Parnell fell from power in 1891. A disillusioned and embittered Ireland turned away from parliamentary politics. An event was conceived, and the race began, as I think, to be troubled by that event's long gestation. So you have Yeats saying that when Parnell fell from power in 1891, Ireland turned away from politics and embraced culture, literature, the revival of the Irish language, and that that cultural movement led to the Anglo-Irish War, the Easter Rising, and all that followed, and ultimately the independence of Ireland. So he was claiming that the independence of Ireland had at its roots a cultural phenomenon rather than a political one. So he, he argued that culture came first, and the politics, the revolutionary politics, followed in its wake. So I went to India in uh, 1980, and I discovered in India that there was a huge interest in the poetry of W.B. Yeats. I can remember being invited to speak at the All India English Teachers Annual Conference in New Delhi in 1982. It's probably still the largest indoor audience I've ever addressed. 1,500 teachers from all over India gathered together. And here was I, a 25-year-old uh, <laughs> green behind the ears young diplomat from Ireland addressing them but the other speaker that day was a man called Karen Singh he was the titular Maharaja of Kashmir his father had been one of the hereditary rulers of that beautiful part of India now much troubled by, by um, conflict and Karen Singh gave this wonderful lecture with apparently no notes and he quoted extensively from the poetry of W.P. Yeats. And he at that time was the Indian Minister for Education and Culture. My point is that Yeats's writing had this kind of appeal that transcended national boundaries. It was a genuinely international phenomenon. And the kind of poetry that um, the Indian that Karan Singh quoted that day was, was the poetry like The Sad Shepherd, that's Yeats's 
19th century romantic voice. But imagine that the man who wrote that poem in the 1890s, 1880s actually, by the time he was finishing his writing in the 1930s, he could write things like the following. This is from The Circus Animal's Desertion. A mound of refuse or the sweepings of a street. Old kettles, old bottles and a broken can. Old iron, old bones, old rags, that raving slut who keeps the till. Now that my ladder's gone, I must lie down where all the ladders start in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. So my, my puzzle has always been, how did Yeats go from writing these beautiful early lyrics that most readers of poetry love to writing this sort of very strongly modernist poetry, really echoing writers like Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot who were from a younger generation. Yeats was probably the only writer in the English language who was a great poet before the First World War and afterwards. In fact, in my view, he was a greater poet after the First World War than he was before it. But, but had he stopped writing in 1914, he would have been regarded as a major poet. But he kept writing, and his writing transformed itself, or he transformed his writing into a very different mode of poetry. So in India, I, I really did learn um, a lot about uh, Yeats's um, uh, renown. And there were reasons for it. Yeats was very interested in Indian uh, philosophy. Uh, some of his early poems were set in India. He was a great advocate in the West for the poetry of the great Bengali poet uh, Tagore. Um, and of course he was an Irish nationalist and that appealed to a lot of Indians too because uh, they saw a parallel between India's struggle for independence and Ireland's. Indeed I, my, my, f my fondest memory really from India to do with Yeats is when we were invited, Greet and I, to have lunch with, um, at the home of a, a lady called Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit, who was the grandmother of a friend of ours. And Mrs. Khan Pandit had been an Indian ambassador to the United Nations, to the Soviet Union, and to the United Kingdom. Uh, Mrs. Pandit had been born Vijaya Lakshmi Nehru, which means that she was a sister of Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, the first Prime Minister of India, legendary um, Indian um, nationalist. And when Mrs. Pandit greeted me, she said, oh, you're Irish. And I said, yes. And she said, I will arise and go now and go to Inish Free and a small cabin bill there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean roads will I have there a hive for the honey bee and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer and noon a purple glow and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now for always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core. And then she went on to recite when you were old and grey and full of sleep. And she told me that she had learned those poems when she and her brother were interned during the 1930s because of their political activities. So that was a further illustration of the, the extent to which um, Yeats's work travelled the world and had an influence well beyond our shores. I just felt it was so, something moving about the fact that we were like 6,000 miles from home in a, a country vastly different from Ireland uh, with representatives, with members of the most famous Indian family of the 20th century and they were all familiar with our poetry, our literature. It made me believe that we had something special that I should carry with me and I tried to carry that lesson throughout my uh, diplomatic career. Also, while I was in uh, India, I had a chance to talk about the work of James Joyce because 1982 was the first time when the Irish state embraced James Joyce and tried to make him into an asset for Ireland's soft power cultural diplomacy. Before that, he'd been regarded as a somewhat uh, dubious asset because he was a controversial writer and he was seen to be maybe um, 
obscene by some or certainly uh, not n not a very strongly Catholic writer anyway, so not in tune with the the kind of um, uh, the kind of outlook of Ireland in the the forties, fifties, sixties, and even the seventies. But by the eighties, um, Ireland was embracing Joyce, and the centenary of Joyce's birth, r you know, resulted in some initiatives being taken by the Irish government. And, and one of those resulted in a uh, an exhibition being sent to India. And I gave a talk on James Joyce and the Ireland of his time. And of course, in that talk, I didn't really draw on Ulysses very much because. Uh, frankly, at that stage, I hadn't read the book, so I have to apologize for that, but there you are. I'm prepared to admit this now in this room, but don't tell anybody about that. <laughs> no, I, I've actually admitted that in my book um, uh, that I published last year. But So I focused on a portrait of the artist as a young man, and I focused on Joyce's statement there, put into the mouth of Stephen Dedalus, who was a character representing James Joyce, that he had left Ireland or he was planning to leave Ireland, in order to fly the nets that had been put around him to stop him from being artistically creative. And those nets that he referred to were the nets of language, nationality, and religion. Now, those issues were obviously powerful and prevalent in the Ireland of the early 20th century, that Joyce left in 1904. That's probably one of the reasons why he left. He didn't like the way Ireland was developing at the time. He had stayed on to fight the good fight um, for a kind of a more, a more um, liberal and more expansive uh, definition of Irish identity. But Joyce left, and uh, he... But, of course, what I realized when I was talking about Joyce in, in India was that those issues were, of course, very powerful issues in India at that time. Nationality. India was a big country put together with different peoples from different parts of the subcontinent. Religion. You had Hinduism, Islam, Sikhism, and all the other religions all somehow together in one country. And what was the language of India? Was it Hindi, or was it English, or was it some of the languages of South India? So my point is that those nets of n language, religion, and nationality wouldn't be relevant everywhere in the world, but in, in many countries from the developing world at that time, those issues were very relevant indeed. And so what I'm saying is that Ireland's experience had a pertinence beyond our shores because other countries were, were, were grappling with the very same issues that we were grappling with in the time of James Joyce and W.B. Yeats. I mean, by the by the 1980s, that, that debate had largely been, been settled in Ireland, um, but in many countries, those issues of, of what is national identity? What is nationality? What is the language of that nationality? Can a, can a country have more than one language? And then, how important is religion in keeping people's national identity together? So, when I went to Scotland, I had my first Bloomsday function. And Bloomsday has become a kind of a second national day for Ireland, alongside St. Patrick's Day, and hopefully soon St. Bridget's Day as well, we'll be getting a little look in too, because we're so trying to now to develop this idea of, of celebrating St. Bridget on the 1st of February. But now I think we will have a reading from James Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, uh, the sermon from that great novel. The Sermon. The preacher took a chainless watch from a pocket within his sudan and, having considered its dial for a moment in silence, placed it silently before him on the table. He began to speak in a quiet tone. Adam and Eve, my dear boys, were, as you know, our first parents. And you will remember that they were created by God in order that the seats in heaven, left vacant by the fall of Lucifer and his rebellious angels, might be filled again. Lucifer, we are told, was a son of the morning, a radiant and mighty angel. Yet he fell. He fell, and there fell with him a third part of the host of heaven. 
He fell and was hurled with his rebellious angels into hell. What his sin was, we cannot say. Theologians consider that it was the sin of pride, the sinful thought conceived in an instant. Non serviam! I will not serve. That instant was his ruin. He offended the majesty of God by the sinful thought of one instant and God cast him out of heaven and into hell forever. Now, let us try for a moment to realise as far as we can the nature of that abode of the damned which the justice of an offended God has called into existence for the eternal punishment of sinners. Hell is a straight and dark and foul-smelling prison, an abode of demons and lost souls filled with fire and smoke. The straightness of this prison house is expressly designed by God to punish those who refuse to be bound by his laws. In hell, all laws are overturned. There is no thought of family or country, of ties or relationships. The damned howl and scream at one another. Their torture and rage intensified by the presence of beings, tortured and raging like themselves. All sense of humanity is forgotten. The yells of the suffering sinners fill the remotest corners of the vast abyss. The mouths of the damned are full of blasphemies against God and of hatred for their fellow sufferers and of curses against those souls which were their accomplices in sin. Oh, my dear little brothers in Christ, may it never be our lot, I say, in the last day of terrible reckoning, I pray fervently to God that not a single soul of those who are in this chapel today may be found amongst those miserable beings whom the great judge shall command to depart for us forever from his sight. That not one of us may ever hear ringing in his ears the awful sentence of rejection. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. Thank you for that. Well, that, 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 that was great. And, and you know, um, that, that day in Scotland, and by the way, uh, we had the event at lunchtime, which was a very bad idea because uh, we were serving um, gorgonzola sandwiches, which was what Leopold Bloom ate at Davy Burns mor Moral Pub. We couldn't find a moral pub, so we had to find a moral consulate instead. But we, we, we and we also served um, Burgundy, which uh, a glass of Burgundy was what uh, Leopold Bloom consumed. But the last person was carried out about five o'clock. So I decided never again. It'll either be a breakfast from now on, Bloom's Day, or an evening event where at least you know the night will um, hide a lot of things. But uh, that th uh, that day in in Scotland, we had some marvelous readers because you know we had a, a group of people that were really genuine Joyce enthusiast. And the best reader was probably um, a man called Owen Dudley Edwards, who's a, a very distinguished academic uh, from a brilliant academic family. His father was a, was a brilliant historian in his day, but Owen uh, spent most of his career in Edinburgh. But he, 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 uh, he read this piece from the Cyclops episode, which is my favorite episode. And I tell people, if you're only going to read one chapter of Ulysses, read Cyclops, which is chapter 12. It's very funny. It's over the top, of course, but as you, as you, as you can tell from this reading when I, when I read it. And this is where Joyce lampoons what he regards as narrow-minded, excessively narrow nationalism. And he kind, of, he kind of lampoons a character called the Citizen, who's a rather unfair lampoon, of course. The Citizen was based on a man called Michael Cusack, who was a major figure who was, who was the founder of the Gaelic Athletic Association, which is still one of the great Irish institutions that survives to this very day, not only survives, but thrives, and is still the premier uh, sporting organization in Ireland. But Joyce um, was having a bit of fun 
uh, at the expense of the citizens. So he describes the citizen as um, a broad a broad shouldered, deep chested, strong limbed, frank eyed, red haired, freely freckled, shaggy bearded, wide nosed, large nosed, uh, long headed, deep voiced, bare knee, brawny handed, hairy legged, ruddy faced, sinewy armed hero. And then he describes his garments. From his girdle hung a row of sea stones which dangled at every movement of his frame, and on these were graven with rude yet striking art the tribal images of many Irish heroes and heroines of antiquity. Cuchulain, Con of the Hundred Battles, Nile of the Nine Hostages, Brian of Kinkora, the Ordry Malachy, Art McMurray, Shane O'Neill, Father John Murphy, Owen Roe, Patrick Sarsfield, Red Hugh O'Donnell, Red Jim McDermott, Sogart Owen O'Growney, Michael Dwyer, Francie Higgins, Henry Joy McCracken, Goliath, Horace Wheatley, Thomas Conniff, Peg Woofington, the Valley Village Blacksmith, Captain Moonlight, Captain Boycott, Dante Alieri, Christopher Columbus, St. Fursus, St. Brendan, Marshall McMahon, Charlemagne, Theobald, Wolf Tone, the mother of the Maccabees, the last of the Mohegans, the Rose of Castile, the man for Galway, the man that broke the bank at Monte Carlo, uh, the man in the gap, the woman who didn't, Benjamin Franklin, Napoleon Bonaparte, John L. Sullivan, Cleopatra, Savornine Delish, Julius Caesar, Paracelsus, Sir Thomas Lipton, William Tell, Michelangelo, Hayes, Muhammad, the bride of Lammermoor, Peter the Hermit, Peter the Packer, Dark Rosaline, Patrick W. Shakespeare, Brian Confucius, Murta Guttenberg, Patricio Valesquez, Captain Nemo, Tristan and Nazal, the first Prince of Wales, Thomas Cook and Son, the bold soldier boy, Aaron the Pogue, Dick Turpin, Ludwig Beethoven, the Colleen Bourne, Waddler Healy, Angus the Cully, Dolly Mount, Sydney Parade, Ben uh, Hoth, Valentine Great Rakes, Adam and Eve, Arthur Wellesley, Boss Croker, Herodotus, Jack the Joint Killer, Katoma Buddha, Lady Godiva, the Lily of Killarney, Balor of the Naked Eye, uh, the Queen of Sheba, Aki Nagel, Joe Nagel, Alessandra Volta, Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, Don Philip O'Sullivan Bear. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> And the Cyclops episode goes on in, in that vein, uh, uh, but it's, it's great fun. And it just shows that Ulysses is essentially a comic novel. Whatever they tell you about it, that's what it is. So uh, then I moved to Germany. And, uh, you know, I organized every year a Bloomsday in, in Berlin. And a lot of my time in Germany was spent um, trying to counter the image that Germans had at the time of Ireland as a, a the home of bad banks. This was during the, uh, during the economic and financial crisis of um, 2009-10. Uh, and in an effort to bring home to Germans that there was a lot more to Ireland than troubles that our banks were experiencing, I visited a dozen German universities with a traveling exhibition on Yeats, and I invariably included uh, some contemporary economic and political points in my Yeats speeches, which, where I often compared Yeats with Goethe in terms of his importance to Ireland. So I, I used Yeats in a way to kind of open some doors and to try and get a message across about um, Ireland's um, um, essential economic strengths, that we would bounce back, as we did, and that they didn't worry that their money would not be in jeopardy um, in Ireland. So 2012... The copyright on James Joyce's works expired. On, on January the 1st, 2012, no more copyright in Europe. And immediately, two German railways, two German radio stations, railway stations, radio stations, produced and broadcast complete dramatized readings of Ulysses. Imagine that. One of them did it every day for about three months for 20 minutes a day. The other did it over a single day in German, read by German actors. Again, another example of how in a culture that's different from ours in many ways, different language, Joyce's work had the kind of appeal that encouraged these radio stations to want to produce and broadcast a full reading of Joyce's Ulysses. At Bloomsday Functions, I always quoted Leopold Bloom's response to the question he was asked in, in, in the Cyclops episode. He was asked by the citizen, what is your nation, if I may ask Mr. Bloom? Now, Bloom, of course, was Irish-born, but his father was Hungarian and Jewish, so he was suspected by people at the time in the novel as being not, not really Irish. And he said, um, and Bloom's answer was, Ireland. I was born here, Ireland. And I made the point to my German audiences that German history would have been very different in the 20th century had Germans accepted that definition of nationality. 
Ireland, I was born here, Ireland. Your nationality doesn't have to come from generations in a particular country. It can come from, it comes from birth in that country. And, of course, people can also move to a country and then identify with that country as well. So uh, then I moved on to, to London. And I was in London as ambassador during the centenary of the First World War, the Easter Rising. So these were two centenaries with very different appeals to different audiences. And one of the ways I had of connecting with British audiences about the Easter Rising was to give talks about Yeats's great poem about the Rising, Easter 1916, which will now be read for us. Easter 1916. I have met them at close of day, coming with vivid faces, from counter or desk among grey 18th century houses. I have passed with a nod of the head, or polite, meaningless words, or have lingered a while and said, polite, meaningless words, and thought before I had done of a mocking tale or a jibe, to please a companion around the fire at the club, being certain that they and I but lived where motley is worn. All changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. That woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill. What voice more sweet than hers, when young and beautiful, she rode to Harriers. This man had kept to school and rode our winged horse. This other, his helper and friend, was coming into his force. He might have won fame in the end, so sensitive his nature seemed, so daring and sweet his thought. This other man I had dreamed, a drunken, vainglorious lout. He had done most bitter wrong to some who are near my heart. Yet I number him in the song. He too has resigned his part. In the casual comedy, he too has been changed in turn, transformed, utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Oh, when may it suffice? That is heaven's part, our part, to murmur name upon name as a mother names her child. When sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? No, no, not night, but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith. For all that is done and said, we know their dream, enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in verse, McDonough and McBride, and Connolly and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Well, thank you for that. that that's, um, you know, that poem is, uh, if you, I think that eventually the Easter Rising will be known for that poem in the way that, you know, the life of Henry IV and is known from Shakespeare's uh, plays or, uh, because the poem if you if you wanted to give someone a, a five minute tutorial on the Easter Rising, no better poem than that, or no better source than that, because you have Yeats um, ag admitting in the first verse that he he didn't take these people seriously. He thought they were jokers. He thought they were just playing games. These were the the Irish volunteers and the the people who were members of Sinn Fein and so forth that he had difficulty with when. They often criticised him for not being not being nationalistic enough, and he just thought these were were not serious. And then, of course, the rising takes place, and he's he, he's taken aback by it, and he then uh, remembers the people who who fought in the rising. The first was Constance Markovitz, who was a 
a member of an aristocratic family in the west of Ireland, Lissadell House, which he wrote about. The light of evening, Lissadell, great windows open to the south. Uh, two girls in silk kimonos, both beautiful, one a gazelle, but a raving autumn, shears blossom from summer's wreath and so forth. So he knew her. It was extraordinary that, that, that a poet, W.B. Yeats, knew many of the people who were involved in the Easter Rising. But he didn't take them seriously. The second person he mentioned was Patrick Pierce, Thomas McDonough, and then finally John McBride, who stole more had gone away from him, <laughs> which is why he refers to him as a drunken, vainglorious lout. Which, but he still, he still says, but he, he too has been transformed by this great event. And he too has been changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. And then you have this line that was read, was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith for all that is done and said. And those lines, I remember Yeats wrote this poem four months after the rising, when things were still uncertain. And there was no guarantee that everything had changed utterly. Many people thought it would go back to what it was before and you'd have the Home Rule Party continuing to dominate the political scene in Ireland. Nobody anticipated that, that the Sinn Féin Party that had been obscure before the rising would, you know, would triumph in the election of December 1918. So Yeats was kind of, he was clairvoyant almost. He, he understood what was going on and he, he predicted, really, that things had changed and ne things would never be the same again. Which, as I say, was not 100% clear at that time. And then, of course, remember, it's a poem of ambivalence. It's not, he's impressed by the, the actions of those who had fought in the Rising, the sacrifice they had made. Now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, these people will be remembered. But he's also worried about how things might go astray, how violence might become more prevalent and might wreck all the things that he had worked to create as a, as a cultural nationalist. Um, and of course, that wonderful phrase, a terrible beauty, it's not a terrible terror or a, or, or a beautiful achievement. It's a terrible beauty. So you can... In those two words, you have a recognition that revolution has its idealistic streak, also has a very dangerous and violent uh, element to it. So he recognizes both of those elements in, the, in that poem. So when I went to uh, Washington, I, I, I realized that the, um, the centenary of the publication of James Joyce's Ulysses was coming up in 2022, and I realized I would be, I would still be in America at that time. So I started blogging on the embassy website about Joyce's novel. And by the way, it's wonderfully appropriate that uh, we should be in a library dedicated to someone, the memory who was born in Philadelphia, because where is the manuscript of Ulysses? It's in the Rosenbach Library in the city of Philadelphia. So the city, Princess Grace's home place, has in its care the manuscript of the greatest Irish novel of all time. Uh, which is a very appropriate um, um, connection between uh, this place and um, Philadelphia. Um, so... I um I I started to um uh to and and the other thing I, I want to mention is that Ireland's had it we've been marking a decade of centenaries from 1913 with the the introduction of, of the third Home Rule Bill for the first time which started the crisis uh, the establishment of the Irish Volunteers the Ulster Volunteers. The, the outbreak of the First World War, um, the Easter Rising, uh, the War of Independence, um, uh, the Anglo-Irish Treaty, uh, the First First Irish Parliament, and, and we've all we've, we've had all of these political centenaries, but there've also been lots of literary centenaries or literary occasions. Twenty fifteen, the hundred and fiftieth anniversary of uh, W. B. Yeats's birth. I had the I had the privilege of 
of, of being part of Bob Geldof's wonderful documentary on Yeats, which, he, which was screened on BBC, called A Fanatic Heart. And I was one of the readers uh, for that. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, you have 2016, the, the centenary of the publication of A Portrait of the Arts as a Young Man. And then 1922, centenary of Ulysses, the same time as the establishment of the Irish Free State. And then 2023 is the Irish Civil War ending. And then at the end of that year, Yeats being recognized with a Nobel Prize. And that Nobel Prize, by the way, was given to Yeats, not just for his own work, for which he deserved it, but also because he in some way represented the things that had happened in Ireland in the years before 1923, the independence of Ireland that Yeats had contributed to through his work. So I, uh, I spoke every year I read, every year the Rosenbach Library in Philadelphia closes the street outside the library. They move all the cars away and they have 10 hours of readings from Ulysses and songs connected with the book. It's a wonderful occasion, and I, was, I, 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 I took part in that three of the five years that I was there. Another year I did it on, on Zoom because it was, a, it, it was a pandemic year and there was no reading. So James Joyce, having been frowned upon by official Ireland for a long time, has become this kind of iconic figure now of... of modern Ireland and uh, I think it's about time we, we listen to Who Killed James Joyce which was uh, and by the way the revival of Joyce's reputation in Ireland started about the same time Princess Grace came here to Monaco in the mid 50s you had the first Bloomsday when people like Patrick Kavanagh whose poem is going to be read now and Anthony Cronin and others and Flann O'Brien went out to the tower the Martello Tower where the first episode of Ulysses takes place, and they had readings out there, and that tradition has continued to this very day. And if you're in Dublin in the middle of June, any year, uh, join the fun. It's always uh, a joyous day of celebration of Ireland's literary heritage. Who killed James Joyce? Who killed James Joyce? Who killed James Joyce? I said the commentator. I killed James Joyce for my graduation. What weapon was used to slay mighty Ulysses? The weapon that was used was a Harvard thesis. How did you bury Joyce? In a broadcast symposium. That's how we bury Joyce, to a tuneful encomium. Who carried the coffin out? Six Dublin codgers led into Langham Place by W.R. Rogers. Who said the burial prayers? Please do not hurt me. Joyce was no Protestant. Surely not Bertie. Who killed Finnegan? I said a Yale man. I was the man who made the corpse for the wake man. And did you get high marks? The PhD. I got the b -lit and my master's degree. Did you get money for your Joycean knowledge? I got a scholarship to Trinity College. I made the pilgrimage in the Bloomsday Swelter. From the Martello Tower to the cabbie's shelter. So, so, in 2022, I, I, I made the argument in many talks I gave across the United States about Joyce that Ulysses is not just a, a hundred-year-old novel, it's also a novel for our time. And I gave an example, which I want to give again. In the Eumaeus episode, Joyce has Bloom advocate for a guaranteed minimum income, which is something that people, governments around the world, talk about today as well. And Bloom expresses his preference for, I quote, a society where you can live well if you work. He wants to see all classes and creeds having pro rata, a comfortable, tidy-sized income, something in the neighborhood of 300 pounds per annum, which would be 20,000 uh, euros today. That's the vital issue at stake, and it's feasible and would be 
provocative or friendlier relations between man and man. I call that patriotism. Now remember, Joyce wrote those words during and after the First World War. When that was a radical statement to make, to say that economic equality or economic betterment was patriotism. When for many people at that time, patriotism was reflected in a willingness to, to kill and be killed on the battlefields of the First World War, or indeed in the fight for Ireland's freedom. So the, there's an enduring relevance, in my view, to Ulysses. And for example, in the Circe episode, Bloom sets out his political philosophy in a kind of a slightly surreal way. He wants to usher in, quote, the new blue Muslim in the Nova Hibernia of the future. His political manifesto is hilarious. He wants to reform, quote, municipal morals and the plain Ten Commandments. New world for old, union of all, Jew, Muslim and Gentile. Three acres and a cow for all children of nature. It goes on like that and, and ends with free money, free love and a free lay church and a free lay state. It all sounds very California 1960s to me, I have to say. But anyway, um, so Bloom is this, is, is this kind of moderate idealist uh, who, um, who is a kind of a, an apostle of tolerance and of moderation. And he defines a nation pragmatically as the same people living in the same place. And Joyce finally has Bloom set out his credo in a passionate outburst, which seems to me to be at the heart of the novel. It's the only place where Bloom actually s- expresses himself and gets angry. He's generally speaking a rather cautious, prudent, sort of understated character who kind of, you know, moses his way through life without trying to confront anyone, tries to avoid confrontation. But when he's goaded in the... Um, in Barney Kiernan's pub on Little Britain Street, which is an interesting place, if you think about it, to discuss Irish national identity in Little Britain Street. But anyway, that's another story. Um, he, so he sets out his credo. He says, but it's no use. Force, hatred, history, all that. That's not life for men and women. Insult and hatred. And everybody knows that it's the very opposite of that that is really life. What, says Alf? Love, says Bloom. I mean the opposite of hatred. So here you have Bloom saying that force, hatred, history, and by history he means the abuse of history. That's not life. Life is the opposite of that. So it's a very appealing um, philosophy, which is why I think Bloom retains this, why Joyce's novel retains uh, a relevance to this very day. So, and I, um, I, I wrote a piece in the Washington Post uh, on the centenary of the publication of Ulysses in which I argued that Bloom, with his moderate, pragmatic view, he's the kind of guy that, he's not brilliant academically, he's not a genius by any means, but he's a sort of a serious character who's moderate, sensible, tolerant, open-minded, uh, and stoic. And I kind of made the point that in a world where narcissism and... Uh, Partisanship seems to be everywhere uh, on, on the rise. Bloom's maybe an example of, of a different way of approaching things. It's, I finally come back to Yeats, and I think we come back to Yeats for a reading of probably the most quoted poem of the 20th century, The Second Coming, which was written in the aftermath of the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918-19, but has resonated through the decades since. And... I, I post a, a, um, some poetry on Twitter every morning on my, at Danville Hall Twitter account. And during the pandemic, I, I posted some lines from, from The Second Coming, and somehow people thought that it related in some way to the pandemic. So now we're going to hear The Second Coming. The Second Coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed. And everywhere the ceremony 
of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. <clears throat> Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. A shape troubles, uh, sorry, somewhere in the sands of the desert. A shape with lion body and the head of a man. A gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking candle. And what rough beast is our come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Well, thank you for that. And that, as I say, that, that, is a, that is a poem that, I mean, I went into a bookshop in New York one day and I saw three books in the front window that, had, that were inspired by Yeats's words, including um, by, the uh, by the Second Coming. I think you could, probably, you could probably have a library or at least a library shelf of books that have titles that are based on the wording of the second coming. So I mentioned that I that I I climbed my way. I think I climbed the equivalent of Ben Bolvan uh, to get up to the cemetery at Rockabrun uh, today. But and of course I remember thinking, um, well, it's just as well that Yeats's body did get transferred back in 1948, because otherwise we'd have to change the uh, you know the wording of under Ben Bolvan to over uh, Cap Martin. But I think we'll stick to the original, uh, which will now be read for us. The final verse of Under Ben Bulban. Irish poets, learn your trade. Sing whatever is well made. Scorn the sort now growing up, all out of shape from toe to top. Their unremembering hearts and heads, base-born products of base beds. Sing the peasantry and then hard-riding country gentlemen, the, holy the holiness of monks and after, porter drinkers, randy laughter, sing the lords and ladies gay that were beaten into the clay through seven heroic centuries. Cast your mind on other days that we in coming days may be still the indomitable Irish rule. Thank you very much. So, so to conclude, I I made the point earlier that the work of Irish well Irish history resonated a lot in different parts of the world especially parts of the world where they they felt a kinship with the Irish experience I mentioned India but there are also many African countries would have which would have a similar um a view and that has been part of the reason why Irish writers attracted uh, such a huge amount of attention but the the second reason, as as President Joe Biden always says, uh, he says, uh, I, I, I'm, people think I quote Irish poets because I'm Irish. I don't. I quote them because they're the best poets. So I think you can tell from the readings from Yeats, and, and indeed if you read any of his, his, his poems, that he was a, a genuinely uh, powerful poet who, who through his life had this constant engagement with Ireland. And if I had to explain how Yeats went from writing the the early lyrical poems like The Lake I Live In Is Free and When You Were Old and The Heavens Embroidered Cloths to writing like, you know, about the baseborn products of base beds and all of that. Um, uh, I would say it's because of his engagement with the affairs of his country. Uh, he, there was nothing in the period between the 1880s and the 1930s that, Yeats, that happened in Ireland that Yeats didn't get involved in some way. So he, he was a permanent kind of presence in Ireland. He wasn't always popular. He wasn't always um, on the money. He was often, you know, 
He drifted off into rather some strange cul-de-sacs, but nonetheless, he never ceased to be engaged, strongly engaged with the Ireland of his time. Um, so, but, but then, last year I started thinking about the words from Joyce's, um, that I quoted earlier, about force, hatred, and history. And I thought, that's very relevant in 2022 and 23, because you have in the war in Ukraine, you have force being used against the Ukrainian people in the belief that force will always win out. You have hatred being unleashed ag against Ukrainians. And you have an abuse of history. You have a particular view of history that is being used to justify this terrible war. But I also um, uh, think of a poem that, that, that Yeats wrote. It's, in, and it's part of his long poem, Meditations in Time of Civil War, written in Turbali Lee in County Galway, which was Yeats's um, uh, summer home for many years. And this is a powerful poem too, and it also relates to the, the troubles of our time. The bees build in the crevices of loosening masonry, and there the mother birds bring grubs and flies. My wall is loosening. Honey bees come build in the empty house of the stair. We are closed in, and the key is turned on our uncertainty. Somewhere a man is killed or a house burned. No clear fact to be discerned. Come build in the empty house of the stair. A barricade of stone or of wood, some 14 days of civil war. Last night they trundled down the road, that dead soldier in his blood. Come build in the empty house of the stair. We had fed the heart on fantasies, the hearts grown brutal from the fair. More substance in our enmities than in our love. O oh, honeybees, come build in the empty house of the stair. My Washington friend Joe um, Hassett, not Joe Biden, Joe Hassett, who's a great lawyer and scholar, written about Yeats and Joyce, he wrote about that and said that that line certainly does. You know, remember, the key is turned on our own, you know, we are locked in, and the key is turned on our uncertainty. And that is exactly how people felt during the, you know, we are closed in, and the key is turned on our uncertainty. I think we all remember the day when we metaphorically locked our doors and hunkered down for what turned out to be months or even longer. So it's as a it's as poetry has a way of sort of of cropping up again and demonstrating its relevance again and again, decades after he first wrote his poetry. So for me at least the period between eighteen Ninety and nineteen forty was a time when Ireland was genuinely transformed, changed utterly. It was also the time when some of our greatest writers flourished. And I think there is a connection between those two things, which is why, in remembering the work of James Joyce and W. B. Yeats, we're also remembering the Ireland of their time. Thank you very much. <laughs> and. Uh, Thank you to our readers. Thank you to our readers. Stand up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you.